life science learners to another installment of life sciences. Well, I'm sure you guys are ready for the next installment of what we're preparing you for your year ahead. Looking at grade 12 and 11, we know that the environment and the effect that humans have on it is a significant topic. This is a section that's normally done in grade 11, but we also follow through this into grade 12, which is where it's assessed. So today we're looking at human impact on the environment, and specifically we're looking at the atmosphere and climate change. And guys, climate change is a, is a hot topic. Excuse the pun on the word hot, but today we're going to look at and focus on the effects that humans have had on the atmosphere and what those uh, consequences have been in terms of for the Earth. And I think it's crucial that we all have a good understanding. Throughout grade 10, 11, and 12, we often focus on humans. We look at ecology. We look at human impact and the environment. But I often need to remind learners that this is a human skill that we need to carry through, not just for school, but to us to understand the impact we have on the environment. And I think what better way to start off as in grade 10, 11, and 12, where we understand the impact that we have and we become stewards of the environment as we go out into the world and finish our education. Lots of you have the opportunity to have a big and significant impact on the environment. So let's try and see what our impact is and let's try and act on that as we, one, understand what the content is and two, see the relevance that this has to us in terms of the future and three, how we act today so that we ensure that the future of this environment is protected not just for us, but for the next generations to come. So let's get to the chase. Right, so in our lesson today, we're going to focus on the impact that we've had. Have you ever thought about the following? How different will Earth be if humans thought about their consequences and our actions? And I think this goes back to thinking of what impact we have on the environment. It starts from simple things like currently throwing away litter and where we dispose of that, saving electricity, using water wisely. And so these are simple steps that we have to consider in terms of our impact on the environment. And for us to understand that impact, we've got to understand the, the context of the environment, the context of what happens in nature in terms of naturally. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. So in our lesson, we obviously start off with a brain teaser. And so today the question is, some of the global warming that has been observed throughout the 20th century can be attributed to the following. A, human impact. B, plant growth. C, glacier melting. Or D, droughts. So guys, these are the options that you have. And I'm hoping that through the lesson that we go through today, that you're able to think about what has had a significant impact on global warming. We will try and unpack what global warming is and then try and reflect on which of these would have been a significant contributor to the global warming that we're currently experiencing on Earth as we speak. Right, so some of our key concepts today and that we're going to look at and we'll unpack these as we get into the lesson is the concept of what is atmosphere. And if you go back to grade 10, when we looked at biomes and we looked at biosphere, we spend a lot of time looking at atmosphere and what makes up the atmosphere. We're going to talk about climate change today and in terms of what happens on Earth and what, is, what, is, what are the indicators of the, the climate changing. We're going to look at what the greenhouse effect is as a natural phenomena and we're going to look at in terms of what are the gases that contribute to the greenhouse gases. We're going to look at those. We're also going to look at the impact that carbon dioxide emissions has on the environment. And we also need to spend some time looking at what methane emissions are and how these contribute to the greenhouse enhanced effect. We're going to spend some time looking at carbon footprint and what this means to us as individuals. We also need to look at the concept of global warming, something that has come into existence, not recently, but in terms of people becoming very conscious about the environment. Biodiversity, as a country that we live in, we know that we're living in a country that is highly diverse, having a variety of living organisms, and we need to understand the context of what our impact has on biodiversity. We also need to look at the concept of desertification in terms of how land is becoming arid and dry and 
and, and la land that cannot be now cu uh, cultivated for crop or for the use of um, animal feeding. We also need, need to look at the concept of deforestation, not just in the context of South Africa, but in terms of the global context. So the first question, what is greenhouse effect? And I'm sure you guys would have heard of this concept, the greenhouse effect. And, and, and to understand this concept, I've put in an illustration, and that's to look at why the Earth experiences the temperatures we currently are experiencing. And what is this in terms of, why is this important for us in terms of our existence on Earth? So to understand this, I've got an image in here that shows you what happens to, during the greenhouse effect. For us to understand this, we've got to look at, firstly, let's try and unpack what does it mean in terms of the temperature on Earth. Now, have you ever thought about why do we have a temperature on Earth that supports the existence of life? Now, if we think of other planets, and if you did do some reading around planets, the temperatures on planets are very different to the temperatures we are ex experiencing. Some planets are extremely hot, some planets are extremely cold, and so in terms of we as humans considering moving to another planet, one of the greatest challenges that we will face is humans adapting to very different temperatures. Temperatures that do not have any correlation to what we currently experience on Earth. And so that poses a huge challenge. So we've got to understand why or what are the reasons that the Earth has this temperature range that may allows humans and the organisms that inhabit Earth to be able to survive. And so that's the part of understanding the greenhouse effect. So when we look at the sun, we know that in grade eight and nine, we talked about the energy, the radiant energy that comes from the sun. And when we try and understand this, remember that the sun provides solar radiation. And this is the radiation that is going to warm the earth up. And we know that if you stand in the sun on a warm winter day, you feel your body warming up. And that's the radiation, and that's the energy that you feel from the sun. So we refer to that as solar radiation. But let's understand what happens with that solar radiation as it passes through a layer of gas, which we call the atmosphere surrounding the Earth. So we have a layer of atmosphere here. And as you, if you look through this, that's that little band that we see. And it's made up of different gases that are surrounding the, the Earth. And this layer of gas is very important in terms of what maintains the temperature on Earth. And so that's what we're going to look at now. We also know that the Earth serves as a reflective surface, meaning that lots of the radiation that hits onto the surface of the Earth bounces back. And so we see that happening in this. So we see that the radiation touches the surface of the Earth and is reflected back off the Earth. And that's essentially the heat that comes off the Earth and is sent back into the atmosphere, that warms up the atmosphere. So some of that heat escapes out of the atmosphere, but we also know that some of that heat is reflected back onto Earth. And that is what keeps the Earth at a temperature that we experience throughout any part of the world that we go to. So the Earth experiences three things. It warms up because the heat goes through the atmosphere, bounces off the surface of the Earth, and then leaves, which is good for the Earth. But some of that we know bounces back onto the surface of the Earth of this layer that we see called the atmosphere. So that layer allows for some of the heat or the, this radiation to bounce back. And this is what warms the Earth's surface up, maintaining the average temperature which we experience throughout the Earth. And so that's, in a nutshell, what happens on the Earth in terms of the greenhouse effect. Now, in order for the Earth to experience this greenhouse effect, it's, we've got to consider what are the gases that are in the atmosphere that allow for some of that heat to pass through, but also to be reflected back onto the surface of the Earth by the atmosphere. So we know that the greenhouse gases are made up of a different collective uh, compounds of gases. So let's see, the first gas we, that we talk about is carbon dioxide, and we know that carbon dioxide is naturally produced, and we see that. We see methane as part of the atmosphere we know that there's a lot of water vapor that evaporates from the surface of the Earth in terms of our ocean bodies. Nitrous oxide is another gas that's present. And we know that there's an ozone layer 
that collectively form part of this layer of gases that constitutes the atmosphere. What is crucial for us to note is that these gases result in the Earth having a stable global temperature throughout the year. And that's essentially the greenhouse effect. It's take those gases, wrap the Earth around it in, a, in, an, in, these, in these layers, and that is what ensures that the temperature around the Earth and that we experience is maintained within a stable global temperature. And so what happens when these gases change in their composition? So that's what we're going to look at in a bit. So some synthetic gases also green, are also greenhouse gases. For example, your chlorofluorocarbons. And by synthetic, I mean these are gases that are produced due to human activity. Hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, you've got your perfluorocarbons, and you've got your sulfur hexafluorides. Now guys, these are just exposing you to some of them. It's not important that you remember these gases, but I think it's good that you have an indication in terms of when you see these as to what these synthetically produced gases are that contribute to also some of the greenhouse gases. We also know that the, the concentration of these are a combination of natural and synthetic gases that are what pr is present in the atmosphere. And these have unfortunately increased exponentially over the last two centuries. And a lot of that has been due to the Industrial Revolution. And if we go back and look at the Industrial Revolution during the 18th century, this was when humans have had made significant uh, strides in terms of the way technology advanced, in terms of we looked at during the World War and the Industrial Revolution that took place in terms of the manufacture of equipment, cars, the fact that we, we started producing coal and a, a coal powered locomotive and industries. Those industries were contributing significantly to the emissions of greenhouse gases. So now we have got natural greenhouse gases, but we've got more gases that have been produced due to human activity. And so the impact of these have had a significant consequence on the global temperatures since then. And so we are going to look at that in the next graph. So the main greenhouse gases are, as I discussed, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and your chlorofluorocarbons. This pie chart illustrates essentially a proportion distribution of these greenhouse gases. We know that a large percentage of them are made up of carbon dioxide. We also know that that's produced predominantly by your fossil fuels. And then we see a smaller contribution of that from land use. We also know that some of them are produced by chemical reactions. We see that methane makes up 16%, and that often comes from naturally from the earth, but also from, um, from lots of animals and fermentation that occurs. We know that nitrous oxide makes up a smaller percentage, and your chlorofluorocarbons, which make up 2%. And so this graph essentially shows you the proportion of these various gases that are present in greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? As we wrap up this session, guys, we're going to talk about what these gases are and globally where they're produced from. So these primary sources of greenhouse gases are electricity and heating, which makes up 31%. We also know that agriculture is a significant contributor to that. Transportation, both road, air, and sea, contribute to 15% of that. Forestry, in terms of the, the industry that uses power tools to actually um, remove these trees, and the impact of removing them has a significant impact on the greenhouse gases. And in terms of the manufacturing sector, in terms of global manufacturing, 12% that contributes to these gases. So the energy production of all accounts for 72% of all emissions. So guys, we've looked at greenhouse gases. We've looked at all of these point to human impact. And so the, the impacts of industry, the impacts of technology, and how that has contributed to these greenhouse gases. So in our next segment, I'd like to show you a projection of how these greenhouse gases have changed over the last 10, 15, or rather 20, 30 years. And we need to then unpack what is it that this is having on the Earth. So you guys have done well. 
I think you guys need a good break, hydrate, come back, and we'll join the next session where we look at more greenhouse impact on the earth. Welcome back, life science learners. So in this session, we're going to look at the enhanced greenhouse effect. Just to recap, in the previous section, we looked at the human impact. We looked at some of the greenhouse gases and their effect on the atmosphere. Let's look at what happens when we talk about an enhanced greenhouse effect. Is this natural? How different is this from the natural greenhouse effect? Let's spend some time unpacking that concept now. Cool. So when we talk about the enhanced greenhouse effect, we're essentially talking about something that is not natural. We did discuss the greenhouse effect in this previous segment. Now we're looking at what happens when this greenhouse effect is increased na unnaturally. So we talk about the effect that emissions have had. What does these emissions do in terms of to the atmosphere? Does it increase the thickness of the gases surrounding the atmosphere? Well, that's what we need to unpack. And that effect we're going to look at now. So the disruption of Earth's climate equilibrium, which is the balance that we talk about, is caused by an increased concentration of the greenhouse gases. And this has led to an increase in the global average surface temperatures. This process is called the enhanced greenhouse effect. Now let's try and understand what, this state, what these statements mean. So we talked about the greenhouse effect being a natural phenomenon, and this is important in maintaining the global average temperature on Earth. However, we're seeing now, because of the emissions of greenhouse gases, and that have created a, a significantly larger proportion of these that they are, then are naturally found, this effect has increased the global av average temperature. So we refer to this as the enhanced greenhouse effect. So let's try and look at this as a comparison between the natural process and here the process that is enhanced. So when we look at the Earth, as we discussed earlier on, the Earth's radiation or solar radiation is going to be reflected off the surface of the Earth. Some of that escapes back into the space, but some of that is then reflected back onto the surface of this layer of atmosphere. And that results in the temperature on the surface of the Earth actually warming the Earth up, making it more inhabitable, making it more conducive for all forms of life to exist. However, on this side, we see what we call the enhanced greenhouse effect. And crucial to that is the impact that humans have had on this. So this is not a natural phenomenon, but this is as a result of human activity. So as we look at the sun, it continues to provide the solar radiation. However, due to human activity, we see that this layer of atmosphere has become more dense. There are more greenhouse gases as indicated. And this forms a reflective surface. So now we see that, again, as naturally would occur, there's a lot of heat that is reflected back into the atmosphere, with some of it being lost and escaping into space. However, we're seeing that there is more reflected and readmitted re back into the surface. So the temperature on the surface of the Earth now increases further, higher than it has been in the past couple uh, centuries. And we refer to this as the enhanced greenhouse effect, which we'll talk about when we start looking at the impact that that has. So what is responsible for all of this? So we talk about increased carbon dioxide emissions. So carbon dioxide makes up a vast majority of the greenhouse gases that are emitted. But a small amount of methane, which is CH4, and nitrous oxide are also emitted, and these come from industries. These gases are released during the combustion of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas, to produce electricity. We know that our electricity is driven by accessing energy stored in these fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gases. And that has an effect on the, in the production of increased carbon dioxide emissions, as well as your methane and nitrous oxide. The world emits 
48% more carbon dioxide from the consumption of energy now than it did in 1992. So guys, that's not a long time ago. To think about almost a 50% increase since 1992 has a significant impact. South Africa is the 12th largest emitter of CO2 in the world, amongst the and it's amongst the largest in Africa. So if we were to look at the comparisons of different countries and the impact that they have had in terms of their emissions, we would need to consider where we are in the context of a, a powerhouse in Africa. And South Africa is probably amongst the top one or two countries that are em emitting lots of carbon dioxide. And this is not a good thing. It's certainly not where we want to be top in. This is some area that we need to work on. And let's see, in the context of the globe, where are we with this? So if we were to look at globally, and this graph illustrates combination of several other countries, but we also see some of the giants in the world that have contributed to this. We've got China, we've got the United States, we've looked at India, we're looking at Japan, Russia. And then these are being compared to over a period from 1970 to 2010. And so we're seeing that earlier on in the 1970s, we, we had measured and there was records of the emission of these um, carbon dioxide that's produced from fossil fuels. And we can see that there's been a steady but drastic increase in the production of these. And some countries, for example, China, has produced a significantly larger amount of carbon dioxide from these fossil fuels. Again, a, a country that is driven by industrial, um, industrial processes. And hence, you can see that these have resulted in a significant increase in the carbon dioxide production. If we looked at a country, say for example, India, it's an emerging, eco emerging economy. Here you can see a steady and a gradual increase in the amount of carbon dioxide being produced. So this points to specifically how over the last 60, 70 years, there's been a radical increase in the carbon dioxide production. Actually more precisely from the 1970s, if we look at that, we can see globally that the production has increased in most of our countries. What is interesting is looking at the combination of the European Union and how their efforts to reduce their carbon dioxide emission has kind of been significant in terms of reduction. And this talks to the processes and the industrial processes that have been introduced by various countries. And there have been various uh, protocols and international agreements that countries have taken together in an initiative to try and reduce their carbon dioxide production globally throughout the next 20, 25, 30 years. And this is part of protecting the impact that we as humans have and the industrial processes that we carry out to sustain our living. And that, that impact is trying to be reviewed. And it talks about the mechanisms that we use to produce energy. We now need to look at alternative energy sources, not because we're running out of fossil fuels, but also the impact that using our fossil fuels has on the future of the earth. And guys, so this is a significant impact that we talk about in terms of not just humans, but activities that humans carry out to sustain human existence on the planet that we currently reside on. So the main sources of carbon dioxide emissions are fossil fuels, land use changes, and industrial processes. And if you look at the combination of these, some of our powerhouses in, in terms of the global context of, uh, that drive the economies of their countries are, are, are being supported by industries. And these industries, including the use of land for agriculture, are, are driving this emission or this increased emission of carbon dioxide globally. Right. So the main sources of these emissions are come from natural sources are generally the atmosphere, the ocean atmosphere exchanges a lot of these gases, your plant and animal respiration, but you also know that there are microorganisms that produce some of these during respiration and decomposition. So naturally we do have carbon dioxide being emitted. However, I pointed to what humans have been contributing. Okay, there's also methane emissions that we spoke about, and this is emitted during the production and the transport of coal, natural gases, and oil. Methane emission is also a result from livestock production as well as agricultural processes. 
by the decay of organic waste in municipal solid waste landfills. All of these collectively contribute to an increased production of methane. So we also have been monitoring methane production globally, and we see that the production of methane, along with carbon dioxide, has also contributed to an increase in global production of your greenhouse gases. Let's spend some time looking at what is carbon footprint. Guys, I'm sure this is a term that you would have heard about in terms of the impact that carbon has on the earth. The carbon footprint is a concept that has been kind of developed in terms of being able to monitor the impact that carbon dioxide has, been, uh, has on the environment. And so we can measure the amount of carbon dioxide produced by different activities. So let's try and unpack what carbon footprint is. So a carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gases which are emitted by an individual, an event, an organization, or a product, and that is expressed as the carbon dioxide equivalent. So if we were to measure the carbon dioxide or the carbon footprint of an individual, we would need to consider what is it that this individual does throughout his day or life that causes the emissions of carbon dioxide. So for example, for me to have got here today, I've had to drive to this place. And so that means that using a motor vehicle has allowed me to get here. But in that process, I would have produced a lot of carbon dioxide that was given off into the atmosphere. However, if I chose to walk or cycle to this venue, I would have probably not produced as much carbon dioxide in terms of being produced from uh, the motor vehicle. So I would have definitely probably respired and e exhaled a lot of carbon dioxide. I would have been here tired, but I would have reduced my carbon footprint. So, so that is essentially a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide produced by human activity. We also need to consider that this carbon footprint has a multifold, a multi-prong approach in terms of looking at industries like the aviation industry, looking at logistics, looking at uh, public transport. So, so when we talk about clubbing together of cars or cycling to work or, or trying to use um, alternative ways of moving around, we're obviously thinking about the emissions that we have from our movements from one point to another in terms of reducing our carbon footprint. So your carbon footprint is a very powerful tool for understanding the impact of your lifestyle on, the global, on global warming. So it's important that we look at how we can calculate our carbon footprint. So the best way to calculate the carbon footprint emission is based on the fuel consumption. The table below shows the most common fuels used and the amounts of carbon dioxide released per liter. So if we look at petrol, which again is what is used in most automotive industries, the amount of carbon dioxide that is released there is 2.3 kilograms per liter of fuel con consumed. Diesel has a 2.7 liter uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide produced per liter, and oil for heating produces three kilograms per liter. And if you look at these, these are the three significant fossil fuels that drive the automotive industry, that drive the aviation industry, that also are responsible for industrial processes. So we use oil, we use diesel and petrol to drive our machines. And so these contribute significantly to the greenhouse gases. Your carbon footprint mainly depends on the following. The amount of energy you use to heat your home, the use of electricity and electronic equipment, and your daily transport. How often you use air transport is also a factor that contributes to that. So if you're a businessman or if you are flying often and drive to school every day, you're going to be using a lot of fossil fuels to get you from point A to B. However, if you walk and if you use a shared motor vehicle or tra public transport, your impact is significantly reduced because you are now sharing that with other individuals that have a common interest in terms of their reduction on global carbon dioxide production. So this is an image that basically shows you the various activities that actually cause or have an impact on our carbon footprint. And essentially it's the waste that we produce, it's transport, it's electricity, it's the fossil fuels that we use. It's the burning of uh, gases to produce heating. What is, what is important is 
in all of this to offset that we need to recycle, reduce, and reuse. And those are significant in having an impact on reducing our carbon footprint on the environment. And this little graph that I have here shows you a comparison again of the annual fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions from various different countries um, that have been projected up until 2019. And so here, if you look at in the 1960s, we can see that the carbon dioxide footprint and the emissions of these were significantly low. Again, through the years, we can see if we were to extrapolate that as a collective for all these different countries, we can see that it has significantly increased. Amongst them, again, we see that China has been a significant uh, contributor to the fossil emissions produced by, um, by, by these countries. If we look at collectively, all the other countries, although significant, have smaller roles in this. So yes, we might not be a significant contributor like China. However, we do contribute collectively to other countries uh, contributing to this increase. So guys, we've looked at our graph that shows it. I think on my shoulder, you will see at the back the impact that we have. And so it's important for us to recognize what we as individuals can do in terms of trying to reduce our carbon footprint. So I'm gonna give you guys an opportunity to unwind, get some water, reflect on what is it that we have had an impact on in terms of the nature and environment that we live in. And let's see how we can remediate that probably in terms of our actions. So guys, rehydrate, have a little stretch, come back after the break. See you now. Welcome back, life science learners, to our third in segment of this session. In this session, we're going to continue looking at things like the human impact on the environment, as well as our carbon footprint. So we looked at what our carbon footprint is. Let's look at how we can reduce the carbon footprint and thus have some significant reduction in terms of our impact on the environment. So it's quite simple, things that you can do. Now let's look at these. So these tips essentially point to how you could reduce your carbon footprint. So carpooling is one way. So simply, if you were to get to school and if your friend was getting to school and you were able to join him or invite him over and use a single car daily for a week and then alternate, that would be one way in terms of you and his parents reducing the impact that you have in terms of the production of carbon dioxide from getting to school by driving two motor vehicles. We also know that you can go week in without disposing disposable cups that you have at coffee shops. So if you were having coffee at a shop and you'd be using disposable cups, or for that matter, at any fast food franchise that uses disposable uh, kind of packaging, those have been produced and have an impact in terms of the way we discard them off. So again, if you were to use your own um, equipment or utensils that you were going out and, redu and reduce the use of disposable, you would be reducing your impact on the environment. Trying to turn the lights off in an empty room, and you know that obviously with, with the current situation where we experience load shedding and the strain that that has had on the grid, on the national grid, we can do our bits to save and to consume less energy. And by that, we're actually reducing the, the amount of carbon dioxide that is have to that's going to be produced because humans require more energy. And so we can reduce that by simply turning off the lights. Instead of eating lunch at campus, try packing a waste-free um, lunchbox. So you don't have to always you know, pack them in plastic and, and then throw that plastic away. You can obviously pack them in a, in a lunchbox that you obviously come back home to that you can clean up and, wa and wash. And so by that, you're reducing the waste that's being produced that fills up our landfills, again, contributing in terms of uh, the carbon footprint that we have. Unplugging your computer every night for at least uh, a couple months will reduce that. So if you're not using your charger or if your computer's not being charged, disconnect the charger from that, which means that it doesn't have to be on a standby mode where it's going to be using electricity even to, to, to just be keeping the device on standby. We also know that the use of cold water uh, to do laundry. So I hope that you know, you're not using 
boiling hot water to wash your laundry, but that again means that you're now reducing uh, the amount of energy required to heat water. So reducing the amount of hot water being used is one way in, in terms of us reducing energy consumption. Um, there's easier ways of doing that in terms of reducing the temperature settings on your geyser. So that obviously by changing it back to from say 65 to, to 60 or in, in summer from 60 to 55 can reduce the amount of energy that's going to be used by your uh, heating geysers to heat up the water. Okay. Okay. Try skipping um, in, um, a, a, as a mechanism. So we often, you know, want to use thread mills to keep active or you want to go out to a shopping mall. Try skipping as a mechanism of actually getting some fitness into your body. You don't have to always use electronic equipment to actually help you gym. Try reducing your printing. Uh, think before you print because you know that printing requires energy. You're also using paper. So reducing our print is significant in terms of our impact. So if schools were now going online and used lots of, of our digital uh, devices to be able to access worksheets and these notes, for example, then you've reduced the impact that you've had in terms of the printing of information and then again um, reducing that impact. Um, cutting down your shower time. And so we know that um, you might have longer showers, but reducing the time that you spend in the shower means that you use less hot water. Again, that has an impact on the amount of water being used, but also in terms of the amount of energy that's needed to heat that water up. And reducing your bottled water. A lot of water that's actually uh, being produced, the most significant cost of that is the production of the bottle and not necessarily the amount of water that's being produced. So reducing, uh, carrying your water in, in glass bottles or in, in bottles that you can reuse is one way in terms of reducing your carbon footprint. So that's in a nutshell things that you can do. The next thing we look, look at is global warming. Again, a hot topic, and excuse the word, or the pun on the word hot topic, but that's essentially what it is. It's the earth heating up. And why is this happening? Interesting. Any clues? It's because of human activity. Okay, so global warming is the unusual rapid increase in the Earth's average surface temperature over the past century, primarily due to the increased greenhouse gases released by people burning fossil fuels. As I said, again, humans are a significant impact or contributor to this phenomenon of global warming. And it all boils, boils down to the impact that we have because of our activities such as the use of fossil fuels. Okay. How does today's warm uh, warming compare to the past climate change? So it's important for us to be able to look at what the temperatures of Earth were, where a few, um, a t probably a few years ago in terms of 50 years ago, and see where we are now. And that essentially will talk to, one, the difference in the, in the temperatures. So we know that the Earth has experienced climate change in the past without the help from human uh, human activity, but the current climatic warming is occurring most rapidly uh, and that's essentially um, because of human activity. So when we talk about the earth heating up and this concept of global warming, it is a natural phenomenon and historically we can see from projections in terms of the changes in, in the history of earth that we've gone through periods of global warming. However, this time it's because of human activity that We've got a short period in which the temperature has increased rapidly, and that's a concern. So why, us, uh, so why do scientists think the current warming isn't natural? One, it's the Earth's history before the Industrial Revolution. The, the climate changed due to natural causes that was unrelated to human activity. These natural uh, causes are still in play today, but the influence is too small or they occur too slowly to explain the rapid warming seen in recent decades. So yes, some people choose to say, well, you know, this global warming is a natural phenomenon and that it has to occur. However, this is not what we have seen in terms of the history of Earth. This rapid change is occurring over a short period of time, and that is a concern. So how much more will the Earth warm? Well, models predict that the world consumes even more fossil fuels today and that the greenhouse concentration will continue to rise and the Earth's average surface temperature will continue to rise. 
based on different scenarios that have been pr projected, the average surface temperature could increase with by two degrees and 60, two to six degrees by the end of the 21st century. Some of the globe, some of the warming will occur even in the future if greenhouse gases emissions are reduced, because the Earth system has not yet fully adjusted to the environmental changes we have already made. Interesting that two to six degrees might not seem significant in terms of the impact that it might have, because we experience days when the temperature could be 26 degrees, or it could be 31 degrees, or it could be minus four degrees in some times. However, if we were to look at the global average and that average changing by two degrees, either higher or lower, that's going to have a significant impact in the grand scheme of what happens on the Earth. And so, and that is where we talk about our glaciers melting, because the temperatures that they're currently experiencing are slightly higher than that they've experienced 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years ago. And so that increase by a few degrees has made our summers warmer, it's made our winters cooler, and you find that that has had a significant impact on our weather patterns. So, so this is a rough projection of the changes in the annual um, mean of the global Earth temperature. And here you can see that there's a steady increase. And this is, you can see from the 1900s, has rapidly, or I would say exponentially increased till the year 2000. And so this is a concern. And if we were to extrapolate this further, we, no matter what we do now, we're gonna see that this trend is gonna continue. And it's important that we have rapid strategies that we incorporate to start uh, tapering that and, and getting that curve down to a flatter um, progression. So the effects of global warming means that we now have ice caps and, uh, and glaciers melting, and this has led to rising sea levels. The rise in the sea level temperature also has increased, and think of the Im impact that it has on aquatic organisms. There's an increase in the extreme weather conditions that we're experiencing currently, so we find that we've got um, extremely uh, we've got lots of hurricanes, we've got really warm um, co uh, weathers in summer, we've got extremely cold winters, we've got more rains that are heavier than we normally experience. We also have droughts that are more frequent than we would have experienced in the past. So these are the effects that we're having. We're seeing more floods, the frequency of cyclones and hurricanes becomes more prevalent, and you would have noticed a lot of these in America. Um, the loss of biodiversity is increasing, and that's due to organisms and living organisms not being able to adapt to an increase in the global temperatures. We're also experiencing global food and water shortages because uh, the ability of plants to withstand increase in temperatures and the evaporation of water has uh, impacted the availability of food and water. Seawater becomes more acidic, the pH is becoming significantly lower, and this means that it's going to affect our fishes and microscopic organisms that contribute to sustaining aquatic life, biodiversity, and in turn will impact on the availability of seafood for humans. And the, the spread of disease has been also a factor that has increased globally because of war, global warming. And so these are just a few images that actually show the impact that humans have had on the environment. And it's quite scary and concerning that we have had this impact and we've let this slip by without really acting. And I think if we were to think about our actions collectively as individuals can contribute to a reduction that we have. It's not just uh, our global partners in terms of that contribute to this mass. It's individuals taking significant steps to reduce our impact. So, we also know that there's a concept of desertification, which is again the drying of land, and that's again a spin-off from increasing global temperatures. And so desertification is going to have a significant impact on our agricultural space, on, on food availability for animals, and so we're gonna start seeing the impact that that has had on humans over the years. As we start wrapping up, we know that the main causes of desert desertification would be population growth, the removal of wood, overgrazing, soil erosion, and climate change. These effects would have a significant effect on vegetation, soil becomes more infertile, 
there's more erosion, and you'll see that there's increased vulnerability to natural disasters. Okay, the effects of desertification continue to also pollute our drinking water. There's an increase in famine, poverty, social conflicts, forcing mass migrations of people and animals. It's caused historical collapse of civilizations, as well as the extinction of species. And so these changes are significant. And this image is quite a moving image. And if you look at that, you can see how the landscape is changing and how this is starting to have an impact on one, our availability of fodder and feed for animals that sustain human life, but also this concept of the, the land becoming inhabitable for humans and animals. And that impact is significant. So we also know that this is tailed in with deforestation. And as I wrap the session up, guys, deforestation is a significant contributor to, to human impact on the environment. So the more forest that we remove, there's less trees available. It means we don't have our carbon sinks that remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So collectively, humans have had a significant impact on the environment. Guys, in this session, we spent some time looking at global warming. We've looked at carbon footprints. We've looked at desertification. We've just kind of touched on of the process of deforestation. Let's look at these in the next lesson and look at how these impact on human, human welfare and the availability of water on Earth. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for staying tuned to me and listening in. All the best. Take care. See you soon.